Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with chapter 11. Chapter 11, I think, is actually a very practical and the most enjoyable of all the chapters. That is where everything comes together, and that is the chapter on heat exchangers. Okay, so let's start with a type of a definition for heat exchangers. Okay, heat exchangers, in literature, in many cases, we would refer to an HX, heat exchangers. And what is a heat exchanger sort of by definition? The definition of a heat exchanger is firstly, it facilitates the exchange of heat transfer. Okay, it facilitates the, chain of, the change of heat transfer, that's the first requirement. Then secondly, there will be two streams, a stream one and a stream two. And these two streams would be at temperatures T1 and T2, where these two temperatures are not equal to each other, of course. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible that there can be a heat transfer. And then, the third requirement of a heat exchanger is that there is no mixing. No mixing between the two streams. We keep them separate. Let's start by looking at the types of heat exchangers. The different types of heat exchangers. Types of heat exchangers, and let's start with the simplest type. The simplest types of heat exchangers. Okay, now the simplest type, I would recommend that you divide your page in two, in two columns, a left column and a right column, and then we're going to look at the two different types next to each other. The simplest type is two concentric tubes, the one inside the other. Okay, an inner tube and an outer tube. And in the inner tube, let's choose there the hot stream okay, and the cold stream. The hot stream in the inner tube and the cold stream in the annulus. It can be, other way, it can be the other way around also. It doesn't have to be like that. Okay, so there's the hot fluid and there's the cold fluid. Okay. Or if that is the hot fluid, we can put in the cold fluid in the opposite direction. So that direction would be in that way, and in the annulus in the opposite direction. If we look at the temperature as a function of x, the temperature as a function of x, okay, like that, Temperature as a function of x. What would the difference be? The difference typically would be that for the hot fluid, for this type of heat exchanger, the characteristics would look something like that, while the cold fluid would do something like that. So in the beginning, So in the beginning, we will have a very high temperature difference, and the temperature difference would decrease downstream of the heat exchanger. Okay. High temperature difference at the beginning, and then it would decrease to the end. With this type of heat exchanger, the hot fluid temperature distribution would look something like that, and the cold fluid one something like that. Okay, so that is hot, that is cold, hot and cold. This type of heat exchanger is called a parallel heat exchanger. And this type of heat exchanger is called a counterflow heat exchanger. Okay. They are very easy to build, very, very simple. And I've built, I've built many of them, typically up to about 100 kilowatts. 
What you can also do is you put the one tube inside the other and you use soft drawn tubing and then you can coil them. Otherwise the lengths are just too long. And you can make them typically very compact, uh, 80 or 100 kilowatt heat exchanger, typically the size of, I can put it in here, not much larger than an overhead projector in size. Okay. About up, up to about 80 to 100 kilowatts. <clears throat> okay, the next type of heat exchanger is a compact heat exchanger. A compact heat exchanger. Now the compact heat exchanger has a definition that you can take note of, but you're not going to really use it. Okay. The compact heat exchanger is described by a beta, which is called the area density, the area density and it is defined as the surface area of the heat exchanger through which the heat transfer occurs divided by the volume of the heat exchanger. Okay. The heat transfer surface divided by the volume. And typically, if beta is larger than 700, then it would be considered as a compact heat exchanger. Very compact. Okay. A car radiator is approximately 1,000. Car radiator. Okay, now, who of you can think of a very compact heat exchanger? A fridge. Okay, what else? It has some fins, and I'm going to say something about that just now. Ladies and gentlemen, any? Any contributions? Nothing? Air conditioner, sure. Okay, there are a few values of beta. A glass ceramic type of heat exchangers, which are found in gas turbines. Uh, typically for a Stirling engine, the regenerator about 15,000. But the most effective and the most compact heat exchanger is the human lung. The human lung, your lungs, has a value of about 20,000 square meters per cubic meter. That is the most effective and most compact heat exchanger, the human lung. Okay. Right. Now, as a rule of thumb, take note. As a rule of thumb. Okay. When <coughs> the moment we have a gas site and with gas we obviously include air the moment we've got a gas site we normally have fins okay. how does fins work obviously we will have some tubes okay, and the spacing of these tubes is already an important thing <coughs> okay, let me just draw three of these tubes and then on the inside, we will typically have a liquid flowing through the inside. And the liquid can be a single phase fluid or it might be a fluid which is being condensed or evaporated or which is being boiled. So it, is being, it, it, is, it might be changing its phase. If we've got heat transfer to a gas or from a gas to this liquid, then normally as a rule of thumb, we will have some fins. Okay. And the fins, the function of the fins is to increase the surface area, isn't it? The fins increases the surface area and you've done the fins in chapter 3 of the textbook of Sengel 
And you might remember that you've worked with fins which were called, and one of the boundary conditions was an adiabatic tip. Okay, what does an adiabatic tip mean? It means that there's no heat transfer there. Okay. So if this temperature and that temperature is the same, then there, if you would measure the temperature gradient, the temperature gradient like that, the TDX would be equal to zero. Okay. And that would then therefore be an adiabatic fin. So those conditions for those fins in chapter 3 can then be applied to these conditions. And usually if you've got fins like this, you will have the gas side moving over the fins in the same direction as the fins. Okay. So that you can have a very good heat transfer. So the fins, so the rule of thumb is to use fins on the gas side. Fins on the gas side, it increases the surface area. That would be the function of the fins. Okay. Now, in terms of nomenclature and definitions, we are also going to refer to a cross-flow heat exchanger. Cross-flow. And cross-flow by definition means that if that is the fluid stream direction of fluid 1, and if that is the direction of fluid stream 2, and if that angle is 90 degrees, then it is called a cross-flow heat exchanger. So this heat exchanger would also be a cross-flow heat exchanger. The two flow directions is perpendicular to each other. Okay, now there are two different types of cross-flow heat exchangers. Two different types. The first type is called unmixed, and the second type is called a mixed one. An unmixed cross-flow heat exchanger and a mixed cross-flow heat exchanger. The unmixed one looks like this. You can show it schematically. This would be the one stream moving through these tubes typically, like that. And here we will have the plates, which are the fins. Okay. And because it's a cross flow heat exchanger, the two flow directions must be perpendicular to each other. And this flow stream cannot move in the transverse direction. Okay. Can't move in the transverse direction. Okay. Now this is specifically very important if on the tube side there are large temperature differences. These plates are actually forcing the flow that it can't go into the transverse direction. The mixed one on the other side would be these tubes. If I can show all five of them like that. Okay. And again, there's our fluid stream one. And now our fluid stream two causes the flow to be a cross-flow heat exchanger, but now there might be movement in the, di in the transverse direction in terms of the temperature gradient. Okay, if you don't like my sketches, there's two better sketches in the textbook to make it more clear. Okay. The unmixed and the mixed type of cross-flow heat exchanger. Any questions? Mm. 
I beg your pardon? In neither situation, the flow is actually mixing with each other. In neither one? Yeah. No, it, yeah. Yeah, no, let's, let's look at this one. And uh, let's look at it from above, okay, in both cases. Okay. So what you're going to have here is that this temperature gradient of, of that fluid is going to do something like that maybe. Okay. And with that one, it might be something like that. Okay. In this case, if you look at the fluid particle there, okay, then because of the temperature difference, this, this particle might have some convection characteristics and you might get that the two particles does that in terms of the temperature distribution. Okay. That is what we mean with mixed. Okay. These two plates will, will, will assure that they can't mix, while in this case, the temperature gradients in this direction, remember, the temperature there, there and there are not the same. It might decrease us. And that might cause this temperature streams on the outside to be mixed. Okay. I haven't seen many applications in industry of this, in any case. Okay, now, the most important type of heat exchanger is the shelling tube. The shell in tube heat exchanger. That is the one you're going to find most in industry for heat transfer applications of a few hundred and megawatts. So the moment you're talking of hundreds of kilowatts or megawatts, then you're going to go into the shell and tube application. Usually they are too heavy to be used in, in transport, in cars, and or aerospace. Okay. They are too heavy. But in terms of workhorses and good value for money, that is really the best type of heat exchanger and the most common type of heat exchanger you're going to find in industry. Now let's start with it very simple and then we're going to make it more complicated. Okay. We make it start simple by starting with a shell. Okay, there's the shell. And in the shell we must have an inlet and an outlet. Make the inlet there and the outlet there. Okay. And you can see that if a flow stream is coming in there, then obviously it is going to go out there. Okay, that is the shell side. Now, what we do is we put in a header. Okay, a header like that. And we put in tubes through there. Okay. That is the first tube. Just to keep things simple, I'm going to put in three tubes. This is the second tube. Okay, like that. And here's the third tube. Typically like that. Okay. And now I can put the fluid through the inner tubes, through the three inner tubes, and for reasons that's going to become clearer to you later, Let's put it in a counter flow type of direction, which means that we put the fluid through in there, coming out there, and let me just use another color to make it clearer. 
So the tube side go in there, it would go out there, and through the tube side the flow would be then going through there like that. Okay. And you can see now that in the shell side the flow is going to do primarily that. Do you agree? Okay. Now this is called the front end header. The front end header. Why is this the front? Because it's the side where the flow comes into the tubes. Okay, that is why we call that the front side. The side through which the flow comes into the tubes. And that would now be the end side. Or the rear end side. Now this type of heat exchanger is called a one shell pass and a one tube pass. A one shell side and a one tube pass. Now it wasn't long after people started building these one shell pass and one tube pass heat exchanges when people start looking at it and, and think well maybe I should modify it a little bit. Okay. And what type of modifications can we make? Well the one type of modification that we can make is we can say well let's change things a little bit in the shell. What we do is, we put in a baffle, like that. So what is going to happen now with the flow coming in through the shell side? It's going to do that, but at the end it is being forced to actually flow like that. So it means we have to put the outlet there now. Okay. Put the baffle in. The other function of the baffle is that these tubes are very long and they start sagging. So if we put the baffle in, we actually support the tubes better. But at the same time, we are actually changing the heat exchanger from a counter flow type of heat exchanger to a cross flow type of heat exchanger. And in the graphs that we're going to do later on, you're going to see that the effectiveness of these types of heat exchangers are better. Okay. So that is the first type of modification that can be made. The second type is to say, well, these tubes, why don't we modify things a little bit so that we do the following. The tube, the flow through there, let's not let it go out there. What we do is we actually connect the tube like that. Okay. So that the flow through this tube would go in this direction and then it would go back in that direction. Okay. And then here again we can connect it like that so that this flow direction is now in that direction. And then it goes out like that. Okay. That is called a three tube pass heat exchanger now. Three tube pass. Because the tube pass through three times. Okay. So let's make things a little bit more simple and schematic. So without drawing all the detail, without look, look, looking at all the detail, if that is the shell, okay, that is the shell and the tube goes in and out like that. If we look at the shell, how many flows are there through the shell? One. So it is a one shell pass and a two tube pass heat exchanger. Okay. One shell pass, 
and a two tube pulse heat exchanger. Okay, the next one would be again, let's look that as let's suppose that is the shell. And now we say one, two, three, four. Okay, so immediately it's a four pass. Four tube pass heat exchanger. And let's make the shell like that. And the shell flow through the shell. Let me just use another color. Does this. Because of that baffle there, the flow is being forced to flow like that and out there. So this is then course called a two shell pass. A two shell pass and a four tube pass heat exchanger. Later on you're going to see some sketches like that in your textbook so you don't have to remember it. Just look at the schematics. It will lead you in terms of the nomenclature. It is obviously important because in the test or in, in the exam I might say the heat exchanger is a, a four shell pass and a 12 tube pass heat exchanger. And then you need to understand what the flow configuration is on the inside. Okay, any questions on the shell and tube heat exchanger? Okay, there's a little bit of a better sketch, if you don't like mine. In terms of there you can see the function of all the baffles on the inside. I'm going to come back to that heat exchanger just now. Uh, but that is typically how it is, how it looks during construction. Okay. It is huge. Okay. A few hundred tubes going through it. You can see the baffles on the inside which are also being used to support all the tubes with. Typically a header. There you can see some of the tubes on the inside. And you can start making things more interesting. These baffles do not have to do not have to be like that. You can go and put them in at angles. Okay. Which means that the flow is being forced to do that. A longer path of flow through the heat exchanger. Okay. Okay. Before we go on to the next type of heat exchanger, any questions on the shell and tube heat exchanger? Nothing. Okay. Let's look at the plate and frame heat exchanger. That is what they call it in the textbook. We normally call it, call it a plate heat exchanger. A plate heat exchanger? Okay. Now, a plate heat exchanger is very, very simple. This is just schematically. Let's suppose there's your first plate. Okay, then. And plate next to it. <coughs> and the third one. And a fourth one. And there will be many more. I'm just not going to draw all of them in. So what you can imagine now is that between these two plates I can let my fluid one flow through it. Okay. And then here on this side I will have my second fluid between these two plates. Fluid two. two. And then here I can have something that redirects the flow in between those two plates. Okay, and the result would be something like that. Okay. So between every plate we, there will be a hot side and a cold side. Okay, as you can imagine 
These types of heat exchangers can be quite compact, very compact type of heat exchangers. They are very flexible in the sense that many of them you can actually buy for a certain number of kilowatts. And maybe things changes in your production and you need to increase the heat transfer rate and then you can do it by just adding on a few more plates. So which is very nice. However, they cannot take large pressure differences. So if the pressures are about the same order of magnitude, typically liquids. Okay, liquids works very well. In the milk industry, we want to heat or cool milk, for example. Process industry, it is being used a lot, but it is not being used a lot as condensers or evaporators in the heating and ventilation industry. The reason why? Because then, the refrigerant side, the pressures are in the orders of megapascals. And the liquids are in the orders of kilopascals. Okay. And the result is that the pressure difference over the plates are so large that the plates would bend and you will have problems with the seals. So that is normally the problems that we have with plate heat exchangers. But they are very well suited for liquid to liquid type of applications. Liquid to liquid type of heat exchangers. Okay, here's some examples of these type of heat exchangers. And what you will see is that people originally started with flat plates and then they decided, now wait a minute, we can make it much more interesting. If this is the flat plate, we can actually change the geometry like that. Okay. Two purposes, it makes it structurally stronger so that it doesn't bend that easily. But at the same time, it increases the turbulence. And if I look at the plate from this side, I can actually also start putting in very interesting pathways for the liquids. Which means that the flow doesn't only go in this direction, but maybe, you know, something like that. Much more complicated. And there you can see some of the, the plates which are being bent like that. Okay. And there are some examples. Okay. okay, any questions on the plate heat exchangers? Okay, another type of heat exchanger is called the regenerative heat exchanger. The regenerative type. And in that class there are two different types. The first one is the static type. The static type. And usually in these types of heat exchangers We've got a porous material. So this is the porous material. It can be steel wool, for example, is a, a very good one. We want a material that can absorb a lot of heat. And if I look at this porous material, what is then being done is that I've got a fluid one flowing through it and increases the heat until it is being heated. Where this temperature and that temperature is approximately the same. Okay. And once it is being heated, and let's call that T equal T1 to T2, we do that. And then after that you're going to use fluid 2. And let's put fluid 2 through there. There's fluid 2, and that would be for time equal T3 to T4. T4. So it has been heated, okay. and now you use the other stream flow, to flow through it, and then you transfer the heat from the one stream to the other stream. But usually, never flow with both streams active at the same time. Okay. First the one, and then the other. Another very interesting application of this is that 
we in Stanabosch University are being funded as a so-called concentrated solar hub. And we are looking at the problem of generating electricity with sun. As you know, during the night time, there's no sun and then you can't generate electricity. And that is one of the big disadvantages of concentrated solar power. But if during the day you can store the heat, then you can actually generate electricity during the night. And one other method of using a regenerative type of heat exchanger is to use rock. Okay. If you use rock in big open spaces, fill them up with rock, and then during the day you've got the hot stream, you in increase the temperature of the rock, you store the energy there, then during night you can actually do the heat transfer and get all the heat back. Okay, so that is an, an example of a static type, regenerative type of heat exchanger. Okay, what can also be done is it can be built as a dynamic type. And as a dynamic type, a very simple example would be a wheel like this, a porous wheel. A porous wheel which rotates usually very slowly okay. and then on this side we will have fluid one here will be, be a baffle and there will be fluid two okay. now let's suppose this is the heating fluid it will increase the temperature of the material the porous material it would move through the baffle and then it would be exposed to the colder fluid and the heat transfer will be from that fluid to the cold fluid. Any questions? Right, other types of heat exchangers, names that sort of, ref uh, are, are typically names that reflect the application and the first type is a condenser. Condenser. Now a condenser is a heat exchanger where if we look at the TS diagram that is a constant pressure line the fluid is being cooled from a gas to a liquid. The fluid is cooled from the gas to a liquid. Okay. So it will enter as a gas, it will be condensed until everything is a liquid. And during that process the heat transfer rate would be equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by H. Okay, let's rather use F. F there and F there to indicate the fluid. <coughs> the heat transfer rate would be equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by the change in enthalpy between those two values. That is a condenser. A boiler is, for example, where we generate power. We've got water which is being pumped to a high pressure. And here we've got the fluid and there's the gas. Okay. And now the fluid is vaporized from the fluid to the gas. In the case of a condenser, heat is being rejected. Okay. With a boiler, we need to put in the heat to vaporize it. And again, the heat transfer rate would be equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by HFG.
Okay, the third type is the evaporator. Evaporator. The evaporator on a TS diagram we typically be in a vapor compression cycle but what is important is is that the heat transfer rate is now from this point here okay, from a mixing point M so the process again is to vaporize the fluid vaporize but now it is from M to G the evaporator remember usually we do not get everything as a saturated fluid it goes through the expansion valve and then the heat transfer rate is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by H by H, let's call it Mg. And to make that possible again, we need some heat, some temperature at a higher temperature. Okay, there are two more types of heat exchangers. Okay, and it's going to take me one minute to explain them. Both are called radiators, but with different meanings. Radiators. Okay, the first one is the type that you get into your car. Okay, lots of tubes with fins. Okay. And usually a fan here at the back for some air, if you drive, that cools the water which is on the inside at a high pressure. Okay, so that is called the radiator, car radiator. Then the other type of radiator is also a heat exchanger, but now it transfers heat by radiation. By radiation. Transfers heat by radiation. Okay, so if that is the ambient temperature and that is the surface temperature, then they don't have a good guideline in the textbook. But my feeling would be if that temperature difference is in the order of about 100 degrees Celsius, maybe even already at 50 or 80 degrees Celsius then there would be a significant amount of heat transfer by radiation only. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is the basic types of heat exchangers. We didn't do any theory today. We'll start doing that with the next lecture, and then we will also look at some problem solving. Thank you very much.